Hi Thomas, um, I thought I'd make a video response because I honestly cannot be asked writing. I write enough as it is. Okay, to address your points, um, the first thing that you said was when you naturally become a powerful country or you like clout necessarily exhumes from this particular stance of being a top country. Okay, that in itself in isolation is correct. However, that's not the way the West won. The West came in through gunboat diplomacy. There's a big difference. And just by reading your comment, it doesn't seem like you know the basics of history, and we all do. We know that human beings do not differ in kind, but in degrees. But within this realm of degrees lies the biggest difference. If you take a look at the countries that have been colonized by the West, they weren't given the choice for emulation. They were coerced. There's a difference. Education was not dispersed to the common people. It was only enough to educate the class to serve the imperial power. There's a difference. Even back then when China and India were at the acme of civilization and technology, they imparted their knowledge through educating the industry or creating the industry. They've always done that. China was one of the first countries to standardize parts. So why did they do this? Because then things could be easily replaced. And they taught this to the Vietnamese during the Red Delta a technology exchange period. So it's completely different from enforcing a racial hierarchy on a group of people that stamps on the shop window display or the external like, like um, surfaces of a restaurant that says no dogs or Chinese people allowed or no dogs and Indians allowed. So the philanthropist... Um, Oh God, his name's, uh, I lost his name at the moment. Uh, he's a very, very famous philanthropist that everybody says. Um, he created a hospital, one of the biggest hospitals in Hong Kong. And, um, oh God, his name's going to come up after I finish this video, I guarantee you. Um, but yeah, he created the hospital in Hong Kong to service the British and the American soldiers who had fallen uh, during the war. But the Chinese were not allowed to be, uh, like, were not allowed to utilize those services. And when he actually, like, passed away, the first Chinese nurse, Hong Kong Chinese nurse, oh, and like I said, right off the top of my head, I don't have, remember this information, but many decades after she declared, like, after the hospital was opened, she declared that it was going to be able to be used by everybody in Hong Kong. So the fact that what you deem to be this natural clout arising from being a powerful state is not true because the conditions were coerced. And also the adaptation, unlike the Chinese and Indians, for example, Indian people are very creative. They're very mystical, spiritual, as well as being very technologically advanced. Chinese scholars ventured west to India to learn of them voluntarily. The West never allowed for this option. It was enforced. And the worst thing about the technological transfer from West to East, <coughs> from the European time frame to East, was they always involved subjugation. According to Ian Morris, the first technological transfer was from China to the West from 1100 AD onwards. Yet that period is mysteriously and surreptitiously ignored by mainstream journalists and academics, right? Why? Because that wasn't when the glorious West held the helm. So when it came for the reverse to happen, somehow all these achievements are highlighted, but with the, like, coercion aspects and the racial hierarchy, the imposition of the racial hierarchy, that somehow is abnegated. And that's what I'm saying. Your argument is flawed. Because when we Asians were at the helm of technology, 
we didn't impose a racial hierarchy on Europeans. And this is another argument that people are really want to make, which I just shake my head. But China called outside people barbarians. What? Are you guys not aware that the Greeks called outsiders barbarians? The Romans did. The Egyptians did. The Vietnamese did. The Japanese did. Like, how is that a stain on Asian cultural like um, aspects or philosophy? That is akin. If that was a global standard, it doesn't mean that China did anything wrong at that time because that was the prevalent thought. Just like now, I guarantee in the future, if this particular trend continues, there will be no nation states. And so the fact that now we utilize the terms, I'm Australian, I'm British, it will seem antiquated and archaic to say three generations downwards, five generations downwards, okay? And they'll say, why were you guys so heinous and egregious back then by identifying yourself with a dear graphical land patch how can that form your identity as a human being and we would seem uncouth but right at this stage it doesn't because i was born and raised in australia so i'm australian despite the fact that i live in japan i'm still australian because my passport's still australian right and this is what i'm saying so that argument will tank asians and africans were not given the choice to adapt to western cultural values they were enforced, but they were enforced with a racial hierarchy in place. So we end up with Stockholm Syndrome. Unlike when technology and civilization, civilization flow from east to west, because there wasn't a grotesque enforcement of a racial hierarchy, Europeans did not have the same inferiority complex. And to deny that is an illustration of how little you know. Have you not read Fanon's work? Take a look at the current Hong Kong, Joshua Wong's and Agnes Chow's. What they're espousing, their own city state that ranks higher in all levels pertaining of modern semantics of freedom, which includes, which includes press and economic, ranks higher than the US and Britain. Yet they wave the flag of somebody of a country that has a lower level of this goal that they're trying to achieve. So if this is not a grotesque and wanton display of white worshipping, what is? Because logically it no longer makes sense. Okay, so now universal suffrage. Is that necessary? Well, let me ask you. How much has life progressed under this system? Now, to take this into consideration, we need to consider what a society is like in times of a rising tide and also when things tank. Because if you do not marry up the two extremes of what can happen to a society, how can you vouch for the validity of any thinking system, right? Let me give you a simpler example. Can you say you're not an alcoholic if you've never had the choice of a drink? Okay, so now look, I was raised in Australia and I, like every dumb motherfucking Australian, said, yeah, we all need the right to vote, even though I never really deep down inside cared for the vote because I realized irrespective of liberal or labor there would be no like there's no praxis on my vote my life doesn't change because for the ordinary everyday person we don't hold multi-million dollar or billion dollar corporations so the tax benefits or the tax um kind of drawbacks that any new legislation imposes doesn't really greatly affect us. It affects us in terms of, say, dollars and cents. It's not measured in hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of dollars. So it's not enough to make an impact on the everyday person. Okay, but I said it was important because I, like many indoctrinated Anglo-Western minds, 
believed everything that my society told me until I lived in Japan, until I moved to Japan. So I've been living here for almost 20 years. So come July next year, it will be officially 20 years, okay? When I came, Japan was already on the decline because after the Plaza Accord was signed and the uh, exchange rates worked against Japan, it's basically been a tanking economy. So from the time that I arrived, it had already sunk for like a decade back then. So now we're looking at almost 30 years of a decline. Meanwhile, Australia and America has been economically has been gone through the roof, basically, in terms of having a stellar report card. Yet what has been really happening on the ground there? Australia is not so bad, but that's because in 1996, the guns were taken away. Don't forget, we had one of the biggest massacres in the world, okay, like gun violence. And so it was after that incident in which the government said, okay, screw you guys, you guys don't get the choice anymore. You, none, of you's, none of you guys will have guns. So that eradicated one issue, but in the States it hasn't. And so within the 30 year decline, this is what has happened concretely in Japan if you come here. The service has not changed. The people are still amazingly polite. All the products that you buy here are still of a superior quality. When it says tear along this line, it literally tears cleanly along this line, not like products in Australia that says open here. And then basically you still need a pair of scissors to cut it open or the seal packs that they have, they never seal up properly. The ones in Japan, if you come here, it seals up perfectly each and every single time. Now, these are small things that everyday people notice. Whenever I buy like a health powder drink here, it dissolves immediately upon a liquid solution that they recommend you mix it with. In Australia, you can stir all you want and they'll still get clumps. So red color clothing, the ones you buy in Japan, they are blood red, yet they don't run in the washing machine. You And, and they're made in China. Yet the same red shirt that you buy in Australia will stain everything, will stain all your whites pink. Why is that? It's also made in China. Why? So these are the everyday things that I can articulate because I'm experiencing them. Now for the biggest, the, the most, this is the clincher. Within a 30 year rise, the gap in America, the one that employs free market um, capitalism most vehemently has expanded to the point where there are two societies in one country. You've got the abject poor and you've got the uber rich. So what do you have? You have San Francisco and California where there are poop maps. And I don't know his exact name, but there was a social worker who was working on the streets of California. And I suppose he had maybe like a cut of some sort um, on his leg, but he stepped on some uh, human fecal matter and basically he had to have his leg amputated. And my Japanese students, because they're all enamored with this American freedom myth, right? So if you ask an average Japanese person, which country do you want to go to? They all say America, okay? Because they believe that is the El Dorado. And so when they actually went there, because she studied at Berkeley's for a year, I asked her, Berkeley is a very reputable university, so did you see any of the great names and things like that? Because one of my other uh, associates, she's actually met Noam Chomsky, so that's pretty impressive. But um, So she goes, no, and she goes, I was surprised at the amount of homeless people there. And that's the illusion that the Japanese press will never break because it's under, like, basically de facto American censorship still. And so the, this kind of information is not commonly known for Japanese people. This is why they hold the West with such high esteem. And so once again, when you say this pervasiveness of this natural power that causes emulation is not true, it's because it's concealed so in order for this Western supremacy, this, and this is not a skin color. Okay, this is one thing you have to, I have to make clear. It's not about necessarily being a white skinned person. The white person as a political model versus a person 
who simply has not enough melanin. There's a difference between the two. So when I talk about white people, I'm talking about the political creation of the white people. So the only way that this white Western cultural hegemony can hold its place at the top of the hierarchy is because it needs to come with a whole package of lies. There's no aletheia here. There's no transparency here. It comes with lies. And so now back to universal suffrage. Is it necessary? It depends. It really depends. Okay. Do you see the world as the noble savage or as the kind of like Hobbes short life, brutal, nasty human nature, the Luciferian nature being in innate? And I've already examined this question in my posts. What was the origin, the cosmogony of what people want to believe in? And I've already written about this. I'm not going to go through it again. If you have the time, go read it. So Beyond Original Sin is the title of the post. And so um, universal suffrage, the idea behind it, it works only upon an even basis of knowledge. This is what the Greeks meant by democracy. Initially, it was limited to free men above the age of 20, so no slaves, no women. The reason for that is because this group had the highest probability of receiving a standardized education. Why do you think initially it was limited to that, to, to that right? Because if you get the same uniform education base, then your basic value, it is presumed to be the same. And hence, you can make a logical decision that will suit the society based on this common denominator. But if you don't have a kind of uniform education base, you, democracy has no value. <clears throat> okay, concretely, I've been in Japan for 30 years. We don't have universal suffrage here. There's no such thing. Okay, so we can vote for like the local mayors and all that. But when it comes to the top, the parties elect the leader. And basically there's like, it doesn't matter what the Japanese press tells you. There's no multi-parties. That, that's just a farce, okay? There's only one major party. And basically they change the face in the same way that Australia and America has two political parties. I mean, all the others are just there for, do you know, like they're just the ugly girls in the beauty pageant. They're just there to, they're, they're fillers. And so basically the two faces that we get to choose from is the same person wearing a different mask, right? So does universal suffrage matter in these times? No, no, because you just think about it. Instead of calling it corruption, America calls lobbying, lobbying, <laughs> okay? So they've changed the semantics of what corruption is so they don't feature on a corruption index, yet the country is corrupt as hell. How can you get two opposing political parties that run exactly the same mandate? How? How is that even an opposition? So this is what I'm saying. If, and I join a lot of online philosophical like kind of meetings, right? And I, I run into this argument consistently with Anglo-Western minds. I said, what is more important? The actual meaning of what a word is or on the ground reality or the name. And like stupid enough, they go, oh, the name. And that's what I was saying. It goes to show how turgid and rigid and inflexible the Anglo-Western mind is. You see, Asian minds are of a different ilk altogether. We don't care what we call ourselves. And this is why despite our stories of origin being the same, there are many cultures like in India and in China, it's the same. They have this origin where initially there was a Garden of Eden and were fallen. But how come they didn't take that and mark it as though everybody was born with a sin, yet the West did? And this is unshakable. I know I'm jumping from a lot of different kind of topics. It's making sense to me. It might not make sense to you. But what I'm saying is it's this stupid, like, pugnant, like, 
unrelenting like fixation with one theory that is deleterious about Western ideology. And this is what I'm saying. It causes so many troubles everywhere in the world. And this is what I'm saying. My central premise is we have an Asian unity because the European unity has a united body. It, it doesn't go further than to have, instead of 80 million for a very strong Germany, you have a group of about 500 million. So that's a sizable base. That's what the Africans are also advocating for, a united Africa. So instead of being like parceled off in many small different countries with a few million here and 20, 30 million there, they've got 1.2 billion people. The, negotiation, the negotiating power is different. And this is what I mean by having an unified Asian group. That includes Australia because Australia is within the Asian like periphery, right? And this is what I'm saying. The biggest problem here is not the fact that Asians have ever imposed anything. We might do something, and if you choose to emulate that, emulate that, we're okay. You can copy it. But what we don't do is ram it down your throat. This is God-given truth. When I was a child growing up in Australia, right, my white Australian friends would literally come up to me and say, you're going to go to hell because I don't believe in Jesus. When have you ever heard a Buddhist come up to a Christian and say, well, you know what? You're going to end up in the seven, like level three of our hell. Never. You'll never hear that. Why? Because we don't proselytize. And we would give guidance because that's what normal people seek and it's also lubrication for society because humans naturally enjoy communication because that's what our brains are evolved to do but do we proselytize do we threaten do we blackmail no and this is what i was saying all political and economic theory has done is just displaced theological values so the same western this this kind of diabolical need to get conformity has not at all changed it's just found a new topic to make its imposition so i have no words for someone like you who decides to twist what i say into something that is tantamount to a nazi regime when i say keep asia asian it means keep our core Confucian values, which no Westerner has ever read, but decided that they can comment on. Because it's this same Confucian value that has stopped Japan in a 30-year decline from having its homeless citizens from defecating and urinating on the streets publicly to the point where typhus is coming back. And remember, like I said, it's a 30-year decline versus America 30-year like increase in economic clout. And you don't see the society crumble. The homeless people here never ask you for money. They never solicit that. They have pride. They set up a small business recycling cans or taking old comics and like magazines from the dumpsters and reselling them for like, say for example, I know, like 50 cents, okay? And then basically they subsist in their own community and they have rules in their own community that they cannot transgress because even within the homeless realm, there, there's kind of like a rites of passage involved. All that is thrown out the door when Western people hit rock bottom, okay? It's like a free for all. It's just basically, it's the no, most asinine and vicious state of being. And this is what I'm saying. Because in the core of what the Western ideology is, is one of barbarity. This is why you lot will interpret everybody else the same way. And like I said, you don't have to believe me. Because you can say I'm a nationalist or racist. Put any name that you want on me. I want you to go and read Native American speeches. I want you to go and read back the initial uh, reactions of 
different African now countries, how they reacted when they first saw the white man. And I'll tell you, they welcomed them. They didn't fear them. They were willing to share their things. The white man literally turned on them. And you can just go and read these speeches for yourself. Like I've read enough. This is why I have the opinions that I have. And everybody else, because they don't read, don't. There's no community that has actually, the first sight that they had upon the white person was to persecute him or basically to kill him without allowing him a chance to even like have his say or what he wanted to do. It's the West that literally came in bearing arms and forced people into subjugation that caused the retaliation. And the funniest thing with Anglo-Western thinking is retaliation is tantamount to the first strike. That's how sick the Anglo-Western mind is. You guys actually think the fact that we retaliate after being hurt by you is the same as striking the first blow. And should we retaliate? That's wrong. And this is what I'm saying. There's no other way to get through to people like you're not even the most extreme. You seriously are, are, are not. You're capable of some sort of nuance. Most people I get are more belligerent than you. All I suggest is that you read more on history. I mean, really read from the interactions of the everyday people, how they treated each other. And you're going to realize something. And I know this sounds alarmingly racist to say. But all the contemporary problems that we have right now is literally due to the white Western race. Palestine, Israel, British line. The, 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 um, the, uh, was it the Tibetan lines, the Gulen lines recently between India and, and China, all the border clashes, India and Pakistan. Okay, the Korean wars, the Vietnam wars. All this is literally due to Anglo-Western rule, imperial reign. You, all you have to do is literally look at these books factually and keep on tracing. All the things that you see, the wars, like Mao's Great Leap Forward, everything, is in response to the initial invasion. So if you guys literally... Don't interfere with Asian philosophy and cultural proclivities, but just exchange technology. There will be no problems, none, no problems whatsoever, because Western minds work well in reductionism. And this gives rise to very standardized physical laws that we can em like employ in technology. So that is the plus point of the Anglo-Western mind. But stay out of our interpersonal relationships and the, our worldview. Stay out of it. Don't interject. We don't need your asinine opinion. Our civilizations have run longer and further than yours. So what on earth makes you think you're even qualified to give us an opinion? It's not. If we should ask, you can tell us what you're doing. But we've never asked. You've just rammed it down our throats. We have asked for your technology in the same way. In 1100 AD, you asked for hours. So that's a clean slate. No one holds a superior reign here. And like I said, the next generation is definitely going to be Asian once more. You would have to be a blind muppet to not see this. So I hope I have addressed some of your points. And like I said, like, um, yeah, you, you do what you will with your life. Uh, frankly, I really don't like, I don't mind you having a different opinion to me because like I said, I don't aim to change your view. I'm just offering you a rebuttal to a comment that you made under my post. I don't give a rat's ass whether you agree with me or not. I don't give a rat's ass whether anyone agrees with me or not. So, later. <laughs>